And just a few words about the test. Did some of you not do the tutorials on voicing and plosives? We're just, I'm just curious. I'm wondering if some of you didn't do those tutorials because I did tell you you were going to be tested on them. I didn't say exactly when. It just seems that some of you were not quite prepared for that part of the test. I will have questions probably about that part of the course on the final exam. So if you haven't done the tutorials yet, make sure you do them. There will be more questions on them in the final exam. Okay? Everybody take note of that. Uh, I hope there weren't too many other surprises on the ch test on Chapter 3 because I did tell you about it. I think one problem is some of you did not check Facebook. So, I know Facebook is a great way to waste time, but please check in on NTU Phonetics frequently, just once a day. Check in, see if there's anything new, because if something comes up, if I remember something, you're supposed to hand something in, or whatever it is, I will post it on NTU Phonetics. I used to have an email list, but I don't have one this year. I decided to do it over, over um, NTU, over Facebook instead. So please check NTU Phonetics once a day or so. Um, that's that. And okay, I think that's about it. Make sure that you also read carefully the two pages that were assigned, contractions and schwa elision. That is also that called Shifan Wayne. So make sure that you've read those two pages, you're familiar with the content. Contractions is page 33. And schwa elisions is page 32. So pages 32 and 33, make sure that you have gone over them carefully. In addition, not just look over them, but I said on Monday, I want you to include notes on these two pages in your notes for Monday, your class notes. Also add notes on page 32 and page 33 into your class notes before you type them up and print them out for um, submission on Monday. If you, for some reason, did not, you think you didn't do very well on the tutorials on voicing and plosives on the test, make sure that you go over those and take notes on that as well and put those in your notes. That will help you remember the material because it's very, very basic. We really need that stuff. And it's my experience, not just at Taida, but just as a human, that unless you check people's work, they don't always do it. So this is a way of checking it to make sure that you actually do it. It's to ensure that you learn, not to... Uh, catch you or anything like that. Today we're going to concentrate on the textbook. We're going to try to get through as much of chapter 5 as we are able to. Yep, that's it. We're going to start now. And we're going to have some demonstrations. We're now on page 113, degrees of stress. And I will summarize for a while, but I may ask people to read at some point, so be ready for that as well. We'll have to give the camera time. This is about degrees of stress. And I think you are familiar with this from your previous English training. You learned about primary stress and secondary stress. Is that right? Zhuyao zhongyin and si zhongyin. But did you get bothered too much about secondary stress? No. And in fact, in linguistics and phonetics, we don't bother you too much about secondary stress. But we're going to talk about it today and why there is such thing as primary and secondary stress. In some longer words, it may seem as if there is more than one stressed syllable. For example, say the word, go ahead. Good. And try to tap on the stressed syllable. So pick up a pen and try to tap out the stress of multiplication. Go ahead. Go ahead. I see most of you have how many taps? You make two taps. Where did the first tap go? Mall and the second? Okay, multiplication, multiplication, all right? Now, why is that? You'll find that you can tap on the first and the fourth syllables, multiplication. The fourth syllable seems to have a higher or the same degree of stress, multiplication. 
It sounds like it has a higher degree of stress. The same is true of other long words such as, go ahead, try the next one. It has the same stress pattern, doesn't it? Magnification. And the next one? Psycholinguistics. Which one sounds like it has more stress? The first or the fourth syllable? The fourth, right? But this apparently higher degree of stress on the later syllable occurs only when the word is said in isolation or at the end of a phrase. All right, from this sentence, you can already guess where he's going with this. If it occurs only in isolation or at the end of a phrase, what are we really talking about? Very good, louder. Tonic stress. Tonic stress falls on the final stress syllable of an utterance. That means a phrase, or it could be as short as a compound. The final stress syllable in a stretch of speech, in an utterance, receives tonic stress. That means it has a high pitch and falls normally. So, try saying a sentence such as the psycholinguistics course was fun. Now, the problem with this is, I want you to analyze the problem. They didn't change this example. We found the problem, a problem with this sentence years ago because this hasn't been changed at least since I've used the book. Uh, tap it out and see what you find. Read the sentence, go. Right, but what's the problem here? Does, does, does the fourth syllable sound just as high as before or does it sound more equal to the first syllable? What does it sound like to you? All right, I'll say it my way and then see what you think. The psycholinguistics course was fun. What happened? It sounds higher still, right? Why? Why? You can figure it out. You have the tools to figure it out. Why does it still sound as high? A couple of you are saying the answer. Compound noun, right? Psycholinguistics course. Course is not stressed. And because course is not stressed, and in addition, do we stop after course, and why? Do we have a little pause after course? Why? It's the end of the subject. So there are two reasons why we pause there, and that's the end of the utterance. The psycholinguistics course, first of all, we pause there because it's the end of the subject. And then course is not stressed because it's it's the head of this compound noun. Therefore, the tonic stress falls on guis. So we still, have, we still have tonic stress. So this sentence is a poor example. Put it in your notes. This needs to be changed in a future edition of the book. Because they didn't realize at the time, and it never got fixed, that actually they used a compound noun. And that does not help us at all, because it leaves the tonic stress on guis. Psycholinguist, sorry, uh, psycholinguistics course. What could we do to find a better sentence as an example? How about the psycholinguistic text was very interesting. It's not a really good sentence. It's still better if we say psycholinguistics, but let's just take off the S and, and make it a if we say the psycholinguistic, let's say study, that's better. That makes more sense. The psycholinguistic study. We've now turned psycholinguistics into an adjective, right? And if we have an adjective, then we won't be troubled by compound noun stress, all right? So let's try. The psycholinguistic text or the psycholinguistic study is interesting. The psycholinguistic study, let's make it was, that sounds more like English. The psycholinguistic study was interesting. All right, say it to yourself. And now tell me if you think guist sounds just as high as the other times we tried, or does it now sound about equal with psi? Try it to yourself.
Does gui still sound quite a bit higher? Or does it sound closer now to psi? Now it sounds closer to psi, doesn't it? The psycholinguistic study was interesting. The psycholinguistic study was interesting. You really have to be careful of tonic stress. It's going to confuse you if you don't know it's there, if you don't know about, about tonic stress. Because a student just told me recently that their teacher said that, for example, uh, in a word, in a, in a phrase like this, they'll say uh, the psycholinguistic study, they'll say that psycholinguistic isn't stressed at all. Is that true? No. A lot of English teachers will tell you that because they don't know about tonic stress. So in the future, when you teach, you will know better and please tell other people so that they can correct this idea. It is stressed. And we've got unstressed and we've got stressed syllables and then we've got tonic stress. So we've got three levels of stress, right? But do all three levels of stress belong to the word level? No. Why? Do all three, all three of those levels, those different um, ingal, those different pitches that we're producing, do they all belong to the same level? In other words, to word stress? Those are sui, word stress, Yes or no? No, because? Because one of them is at the sentence level, that's right. Tonic stress is at the sentence level, it's intonation, it's part of intonation, it's not part of word stress. This confuses people and even even a lot of ESL texts that come out of the states, people who are supposed to be experts in English, they often don't know this and they confuse the issues. All right, so the psycholinguistic study was interesting. Now it sounds like they're about the same level. It says, you will find that there is no difference between the first and fourth syllables of psycholinguistics in this modified sentence. If you have a higher degree of stress on the fourth syllable in psycholinguistics, this word will be given a special emphasis as though you were contrasting some psychology course with a psycholinguistics course. So he's saying if you made the psycholinguistics course, in ways of compound, he says that if you stress linguist too much, it's because you're contrasting it with psychology. The psychology course was interesting. The psycholinguistics course was interesting. Contrast, 不是,是因为compound stress的关系. So, 这一段话是需要修改. So, when I test you, I'm going to test you on what I've told you now, not exactly what they wrote here. Mm. It says the same is true of the word mag magnification in this sentence, such as, the degree of magnification depends on the lens. We have another problem here. We don't have the problem of compound noun stress. But try the sentence yourself. All right, listen to me read it, and I'm not doing anything special or different to prove a point. This is just the way I would read it. I want to put this down so I can have my pen here to tap. The degree of magnification depends on the lens. Now, in theory, magnification, the point he wants to make is magnification, the mag and the k are about the same pitch, right? But is that what you heard me say? No. And I'm not doing something weird just to talk fine, Daryl, really. It's just the way I say it. And why did I say it that way? Tonic stress because we don't have a compound noun this time, but why? Same reason, it's the end of the subject. So we're going to pause. Whenever we pause, that means we had a tonic stress right before the pause, right? So this part really needs revising. Um, Professor Johnson, OK, I hope you heard that. Uh, <laughs> really. The word magnification will not have a larger stress on the fourth syllable as long as you do not break the sentence into two parts and leave this word at the end of a phrase. But we did break it because that's what we normally do in English. If we force ourselves not to break it, why are you telling us something to do something that goes against what we normally do when we're speaking English? So I take issue with this paragraph. I'm not, I'm not uh, dissing the book. It's a great book, but this part needs a little fixing. All right, this part is clear. What he's saying is that secondary stress is an illusion due to, due to what reason? 次中音则是一个, because of, because of tonic stress. Yeah, what we're hearing is tonic stress. So we think that's the primary stress. 
And then we hear another stress syllable, we say that's secondary. But in fact, he's saying here that it's due to tonic stress, that we hear one stress syllable as more stress than the other. Why does it seem as if there are two degrees of stress in a word when it occurs at the end of a phrase or when it is said alone, which is, of course, at the end of a phrase? The answer is that in these circumstances, another factor is present, as we will see in the next section. The last stress syllable in a phrase, let's just say an utterance, because it's not always a whole phrase. An utterance, 一段话, the Chinese is even clearer than the English. 一段话 just means a stretch of speech. I like that. But you can say an utterance, that's fine. Often accompanies a special peak in the intonation, the tonic accent. Some people call it accent. They like to use accent for 句子这个层次. 他用accent而不用stress. 我用stress已经用习惯了. But they're the same thing. Tonic accent you will hear often. 因为accent它用来指那个跟语调跟sentence intonation有关的重音. In longer words containing two stresses, the apparent difference in the levels of the first and second stress is really due to the superimposition, 就是套加十加在它的上面, of an intonation pattern. When these words occur within a sentence in a position where the word does not receive tonic accent, then there are no differences in the stress levels. Okay, that's what we just demonstrated. Okay, next page. A lower level of stress may also seem to occur in some English words. Okay, 是因为tonic stress的关系,这是第一个,现在是第二个问题. A lower level of stress may also seem to occur in some English words. Compare the words in the two columns in table 5.3. The words in both columns have the stress on the first syllable. Now let's read them carefully, left to right, and then we should note if one of the other syllables sounds longer or sounds more stressed. So read the first word on the left. Good. Now compare it to the one on the right. Does it sound like the one on the left has a secondary stress? Multiply, multiple. Or if it's not a secondary stress, does it sound like we have a stressed syllable, an unstressed syllable, and then another syllable that's not quite unstressed? Which, which syllable is it? Ply. How about multiple? Does that have the same feeling? Okay, some said yes, but nah. If you said yes or no, actually, his point is that multiply, multiple. We can hear there's a difference in length, right? Which one's shorter? Right, multiply sounds longer. Let's try a couple more. Regulate, regular. Why don't you just listen now and then see if you sense that the last syllable in column one sounds more stressed than the last syllable in the word in column two. Okay, Ma? That all clear? Regulate, regular. Copulate, copula. Circulate, circular. Criticize, critical. Minimize, minimal. Does it sound like the third syllable in the words in column one has some kind of stress? And in the words in the column on the right, it sounds like they're shorter. They don't really have that stress. Now, what is the reason for that? He's going to explain. The words in the first column differ from those in the second by having, note for test, by having a full vowel in the final syllable. We have a full vowel. And in all cases, it is what kind of, so wait, a full vowel, so some What kind? A diphthong, exactly, very good. They all contain a diphthong in the final syllable, in the first column. This vowel is always longer than the reduced vowel, usually a uh, schwa, in the final syllable of the words in the second column. So in the second column, we have a bunch of schwas, multiple, regular, copula, circular, including the ER type schwa, minimal, critical, dung dung. So, that diphthong is longer. We know that diphthongs are longer. If you just look at the structure, because a diphthong actually contains 
two vowels. Now, they're not as long as two separate vowels, and they are squeezed into one syllable, but they are still longer than any monophthong. I is going to be longer than a or e or any monophthong. They're still longer, so we can expect that. The result is that there is a difference in the rhythm of the two sets of words. This is due to a difference in the vowels that are present. It is not a difference in stress. Everybody got that? That's the point he's making. This is a second illusion that we have of stress. The first illusion was due to tonic stress or tonic accent. The second one is due to diphthongs, longer vowels. There is not a strong increase in respiratory activity on the last syllable of the words in the first column. Both sets of words have increases in respiratory activity only on which syllable? The first syllable. So multiply. Multi I didn't say multiply. I didn't have an increase in respiratory activity is what he's saying. So that doesn't count as stress. It's just a longer vowel. It's more prominent. 比较显著。比较显著,并不等于有重音。Okay? That was the point. Two very clear points that should be easy to put in your notes. In summary, we can note that the syllables in an utterance vary in their degrees of prominence. 它显著的程度会有不同。but these variations are not all associated with what we want to call stress. A syllable may be especially prominent because it accompanies the final peak in the intonation. That's tonic stress or tonic accent. We will say that syllables of this kind have a tonic accent. Given this, we can note that English syllables are either stressed or unstressed. So he has here a dichotomy, a binary system. 一个二元的一个系统。要不然是on,要不然是off,要不然是有重音,要不然是没有重音. There's nothing in between. 没有分等级,没有主要重音,没有次重音. There's only stress or not stressed. That's all he has. There are two other things that happen. One is due to tonic accent. One is due to diphthongs or long vowels, full vowels. Um, okay. If they are stressed, we can say that English syllables are either stressed or unstressed. If they are stressed, they may or may not be the tonic stress syllables that carry the major pitch changes in the phrase. 它有没有 tonic stress? 其实跟这个无关,它可能有,可能也没有. If they are unstressed, they may or may not have a reduced vowel. 没有重音的情况之下,它可能是一个刷,也可能不是一个刷,可能是一个很长的一个刷母音,可是照样是没有重音的. Clear? I had my doubts about this for years, but I guess I've come around and I now accept pretty much what he says. Um, these relationships are shown in figure 5.2. So let's work out that little table. We've got a flow chart on page 115 at the top. We start with a syllable. And this syllable is either what or what? Either stressed or? In the event that it is stressed, it may have tonic stress or it may have Non-tonic stress. It's not known, by the way. It's non, non-tonic stress. So, 它可能有,那个叫语调重音 in Chinese, by the way. Tonic stress is called 语调重音. And I only know that because of the 诗的 paper. I had to translate it into Chinese. I finally figured out the Chinese. So, 语调重音 is tonic stress. It may have it, it may not. Another possibility for a syllable is it may be completely on the right. Unstressed, and don't say unstressed, by the way. 大家注意要发音,不是 unstressed, it's un. Did the tip of your tongue touch your alveolar ridge? Unstressed, don't say unstressed, unstressed. And in the event that it's unstressed, we may have a schwa, right? It very often is a schwa, a reduced vowel. Or it may be an unreduced vowel. 它也可能是,不是schwa,它是一个完整的母音,就是没有重音而已。so we end up with four different possibilities, which might make some people think there are four different levels of stress, right? Kaima, is everybody with me? If you're not, please raise your hand. Let's clarify. Everybody's with me. Good. We're going to continue. Um, bottom of 114, as an aid to understanding the differences between these processes or processes, I hear both, and it's hard for me to figure out which one I should use. I, I used to use processes. Consider the set of words, explain, explanation, exploit, exploitation. Now we're going to have 
examples of what we were just talking about. If each of these words is said in its citation form as a separate tone group, the set will be pronounced as shown below. And we're using a schematic representation of the intonation peak. So the intonation peak is indicated with that arrow pointing upwards. The stress is where? Let's read the words across from explain. Go right, go. Explain. The second one? Explanation. So we've got stress on two syllables there, both X and nay, but one of them has tonic stress. All right. The next word? The stress is on the second syllable, ploit, or sploit, exploit. I have a so there. And it also has, in addition to word stress, it also has Tonic stress because it's in isolation. tonic stress. So it's got two reasons for sounding really prominent. Exploit has word stress and tonic stress. The next one to the right. Exploit. Good. How many stresses do we have? Two, both on X and T, but T also has tonic stress. It's got two reasons for being prominent, so it sounds higher. Exploitation. Exploitation. Let's look at the um, text below. You can see the IPA right under it. Another way of representing some of these facts is shown in table 5.4. This table shows just the presence, plus or absence, minus of an intonation peak, a tonic accent, a stress, and a full vowel in each syllable in these four words, considering the Considering first the stress in the middle row, note that the two-syllable words are marked plus stress on the second syllable and the four-syllable words are marked plus, plus stress on both the first and third syllables. We've already gone over this, but this will make it even clearer. Let's look at the top of 116. So let's go over the whole thing that we just did now, but this time we're using minuses and pluses. That will make it even clearer. Explain. Where's the plus? Plain. Right. Explanation. It's on, we're talking about tonic accent now. Digahapyal is a tonic accent, so I should have made that clear. So the tonic accent is on plain. It's always on the final stress syllable. Uh, for explanation, it's on nay. For exploit, exploit. And for exploitation, all right, we've got a plus on the tonic stress for each of those words. Now, just ordinary word stress. We're not thinking about tonic stress now, just plain old word stress. And we have all of the same answers, except we have two additional answers, namely in explanation, it's also on X, and in exploitation, also on X. So that's word stress. For word stress, we get two stresses for the longer words. And finally, let's mark the full vowels. For explain, again, it's the same. A is a, is a diphthong, so that obviously gets a plus as a full vowel. Explanation. Is X a full vowel? Yes, it's not a diphthong this time, but it is a full vowel. It's not explanation. You could say it, explanation, but it sounds a little odd. I usually say explanation. I use a full vowel there. So we give a plus for all the full vowels. X gets one, and play gets one. Exploit. 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 I have a full vowel on X, by the way. I do differently. Exploit. He's trying to exploit the workers. You can say exploit, but if I read it in isolation, I usually give it a full vowel. But let's just, for the sake of argument, let's say it's a schwa, exploit. Yeah, we're just going to say that for the sake of argument. Uh, I probably would use a full vowel. And then for the noun, uh, the, the um, abstract noun, we have X and we have ploit from the previous, from the previous lines, but we also have Oi, because that is a full vowel. We have a diphthong there. So we've got three pluses in exploitation. How many stresses does it have? Word stresses? Two, but it may sound like it has three, maybe, because of the oi, a full vowel. That's his point. He just wants to illustrate the same thing that we just discussed. <clears throat> um, Okay, second paragraph on 115. As you can see by comparing the middle row with the top row, the last plus stress syllable in each word has been marked plus tonic accent. There is a 
plus in the third row if the vowel is not reduced, like exploi. Note that the difference in rhythm between explanation and exploitation is that the second syllable of explanation has a reduced vowel, but this, but this syllable in exploitation has a full vowel. Let's see if you can sense a difference in rhythm. Listen. Explanation, explanation, exploitation, exploitation. I think the length is about the same, frankly, but plen is reduced and ploit is not reduced. So it sounds more prominent. Because it's a full vowel, especially since it's a diphthong. Okay? All right? Mm. He's using this to build up to a theory that's coming, and you have pretty much most of the elements already. As we saw in the previous chapter, there are a number of vowels that do not occur in reduced syllables. We didn't get that. We haven't done the previous chapter. You'll find it out depending on how much of chapter four we can finish before the end of the semester. Furthermore, the actual phonetic quality of the vowel in a reduced syllable varies considerably from accent to accent. And we just illustrated that because I said, I usually use a full vowel in which word? Exploit. I don't usually say exploit. I say exploit, as far as I know. When I'm thinking about it, I say exploit. When I'm not thinking about it, I'm not paying attention, so I don't know. Um, we have transcribed the first vowel in explain as i, because that is the form Peter Latifog had used. Explain, explain. And that's more common in British English. And you'll find that, and that's why you learned, like, for example, patted, for example, roses, is, right? And I can confirm that with my British, I've confirmed it with my British English teacher. We've been talking for a long time. Okay? So, they've left it the way Peter Latifoged transcribed it as ex, explain, explain. Um, some other books, this is hard to hold with both of them, we'll try this, okay? Do not make the distinctions described here, maintaining instead that there are several levels of stress in English. Now, some other books, they don't tell you which ones, but they go in the direction of formalism, okay? Maintaining instead that there are several levels of stress in English, the greatest degree of stress is called stress level one, the next level two, the next level three, a lower level still is level four, and so on. Note that in this system, a smaller degree of stress has a larger number. So the larger the number, number one is the strongest. You can easily convert our system into a multi-level stress system, system by adding the number of plus marks on a syllable in a table of the sort just used and subtracting this number from four. All right, let's try that and see if it works. If we want to find out the stress level according to these so way to other books, how many, um, what level of stress, for example, is plain and explain? That means add up the number of pluses and subtract it from four. What's the answer? Look at, yeah, that's right, I heard the answer. Look at table 5.4 at the top of 116 again. Got it? Now, in order to determine the level of stress according to this so way to other system from other books, we add up the number of pluses in each column. So look at Ilia and then count the number of pluses and subtract it from four. So if we looked at the if we look at the plane and explain, what's what level of stress does it have? What number do we assign it? One, because it's how many pluses? Three and four minus three is one. That's how it works. How about what is the level of stress for X and explain? We add up the number of explain. Add up the number of pluses and subtract it from four in explain, x. Yeah, the letter, right, the number we assign it is four because it has no pluses, right? Four minus zero is four. Let's try another one. The x in explanation. Some of you probably jumped ahead to explanation. So if you look at the x in explanation, 
Count up the pluses, subtract from four. What degree of stress do we assign that? Two. We've got two pluses, four minus two is two. Let's try the exploit, the, the ex exploit and exploitation. What level do we assign that? One. And how about, how about the word, ex how about the syllable exploit, just exploitation, Debussy. Exploitation, the te, that's what I really meant to talk about. So exploit, yes, one, mail it's well. So then I jumped out exploitation. What level of stress is assigned to te? One, that's four minus three is one. How about the oit in exploitation? What level do we assign that? Three, right? It should be unstressed, completely unstressed, but because of the because of the full vowel, the diphthong, we're giving it we're giving it a point here. Okay? So that's how that works. Writing the stress levels as superscripts after the vowels, you will find that explanation and exploitation are two, four, one, four, etc. And you can see the rest in your book. So those are the levels that we just assigned ourselves. We do not consider it useful to think of stress in terms of a multi-level system. So he keeps saying, other books say this. And by saying other, what is he telling you? He's saying some books do this. So what is he telling you about his own feelings? I don't agree. All right, he doesn't agree. He doesn't buy that. You can figure out their system by following, just by drawing one of these tables, and you will be able to assign every syllable uh, a stress level one through four according to those other books, but he thinks it's not useful to do that. He feels that descriptions of this sort are not in accord with the phonological facts. Okay, he's now speaking Thai. Okay, this is his Zheng Zili Chang. And he did definitely have a very strong Zheng Zili Chang, and you can guess very much both from comments I make and from things you see in the book. But as it is so commonly said that there are many levels of stress in English, we're now on 116 at the top. Page 116, first paragraph. We thought we should explain how these terms are used. He's saying, I think that this is not useful, to be polite. Yeah. He could, you could say it's a bunch of nonsense or something. But he says, it's not useful. But I thought I should tell you because other books will find. You will, will have it. And you will come and ask me, well, what's wrong? Didn't I learn it this way, but this book says it that way? And you will find that in the future. Um, that's why we try to mention what other books say sometimes, for example. We insist on ch being written with two symbols, but we'll tell you that it's often written like this in other books, so that when you see it, you won't freak out. And you will know that it's a different point of view for a different purpose, different analysis. It makes sense on its own terms, but it's not the one that Peter Latifoget adopts, OK? In this book, however, we will continue to regard stress as something that either does or does not occur on a syllable in English. So he says there's no such thing as primary and secondary stress. There's just stress. And other effects that you notice are either due to tonic stress, tonic accent, or to full vowels in an unstressed syllable. Um, we can sometimes predict by rules whether a vowel will be reduced to schwa, uh, or not. For example, we can formalize a rule stating that oi never reduces. You can put that in your notes. We haven't had that yet. It's in chapter four. But oi never turns to schwa. As far as we know, it never happens. It's just one of those weird vowels that insists on maintaining its own identity. You know that in a group of people, there's often a person who maybe grows his hair really long, wears a hat, and wears really unusual clothes. And no matter what, he will just insist on being like that. Other people will try to dress like everybody around you, but this person just dresses exactly like he wants wherever he goes. I have a friend like that. I don't need to uh, go into more detail, but he dresses up like an Indian. So you will see my friend anywhere. You see somebody who's a white American but looks like an Indian. That's my friend. So he has a bit, you know who it is. Um, he has a very strong identity, and he's very comfortable with that. He never turns to a schwa. He will never turn to a schwa. He is always an oi. OK? You got it? So he's very much confident and happy with what he is, and he never changes. Most of the other vowels will turn to a schwa under some circumstances. Not all of them, but most of them will. Oi is one that does not. But other cases seem, 
seem to be a matter of how recently the word came into common use. Factors of this sort seem to be the reason why there should be reduced vowels at the end of postman, bacon, gentleman, but not at the end of mailman, moron, superman. Okay, did you notice that? If a word is very recent and we're not very familiar with it yet, will we tend to put a schwa there in the, in the unstressed syllable? If it's 比较没有那么熟悉的一个新的字, 我们会倾向于用刷还是不用刷? 不用刷, 就是不用刷, 不熟悉的是不用刷. We will pronounce the vowels really clearly because it's not that well known. It has a relatively higher what? Information value. 资讯价值比较高的, we're not going to use a schwa. 因为我们必须要讲得很清楚, 对方比较不容易预测到你要讲那个字, 不是那么熟, 你讲得太快, 有点含糊, 他听不懂, 讲得很清晰, 他才, 才比较容易听懂, That's the purpose of schwa. It is very much like the purpose of the qingsheng in Beijing Mandarin. Remember when we were talking about uh, Chinese white radish? Remember when we were talking about Chinese white radish? What do we call it? In Taiwan, we call it? What do you call it? Right. But in Beijing, you call it? Right. Now, is that a familiar vegetable? Is that a familiar vegetable? It's extremely familiar. It's one of the most common vegetables you have. Bai cai and luo bo, right? In Taiwan, we have a different situation. Mandarin was brought in as an outside language, an outside dialect. It was imposed on Taiwan. I'm not getting political here. I, I have no particular political leanings. But Mandarin was brought in. Mandarin would not be spoken by so many people unless it were imposed on Taiwan. Most people would probably be speaking what? Even now, but Mandarin was imposed as the official national language used for education, culture, all kinds of fields. So, in the Mandarin that came in, and I remember I had this discussion with you before, it was by all kinds of people. Anybody who could manage was teaching Mandarin. They followed the textbook and they used full tones. This is the best explanation that I have, and I have looked into this. So, for you now, you're very familiar with Mandarin. Your Mandarin is probably your best language, much better than your Minayu, even if you speak Minayu. Because that's the way your parents and your grandparents were taught. So you just kept the system up. Citation form. Citation form. So it's a normal language for you. The funny thing is that there are lots of Qingsheng in Beijing Mandarin, right? And some people like to, like to explain things that happen in Taiwan Mandarin by saying, ah, that's Minayu's Don't you always hear that? That's Minayu's That's why Taiwan Mandarin sounds the way it does. The funny thing is that, Minayu, you have Qingsheng? I'm going to give you a gongke because this is your language. I don't want to just dump the facts on you because I've studied it and I, I have some facts ready. But everybody, this is Zuo Ye. I'm going to ask you next time. Use whatever sources you can find, internet, books, anything you can find. But if you ask like an old person who speaks good Minayu, you may not get the information as fast because they don't analyze it. So I want you to go and find out as best you can, whatever sources you want to use. Now if you want to go to um, then they can tell you the best. But there are also textbooks, there's the internet, there are a lot of places. I want you to tell me if Minayu has Qingsheng. The reason I say this is because you'd think that, be, that 
The reason that Taiwan Mandarin has almost no qingsheng, we have qingsheng, right? The most Aside from these shoots, So we would expect that Minayu probably doesn't have qingsheng either. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I want you to do the research. All right? But the thing is, we're going back to schwa's. In English, when we use a schwa, that's a 代表是有相当的熟悉度。已经用了很久了，我们才会给他一个刷. So look at these words here. We have post, postman, postman. We say postman, not postman. We say postman. That's an older word. It was old when I was young. All right, so it's pretty old. So postman, bacon, not bacon, gentleman. We don't say gentleman. A gentleman is a very but gentleman is different. But for mailman, we don't say mailman normally. We say mailman. And we also say moron. We don't say moron. Okay, moron is a bad thing. All right. I think it's another reason. We are very strong. Moron. We don't say moron. We don't say moron. We don't say so you know, on, which is say you know, sound symbolism. Moron, you know, 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 you 越新的东西越不敢用轻声会讲那个 full tone Same with Chua in English And that's a pretty good place to break We'll take a break um, The psycholinguistic study is interesting was my original sentence And then I changed it to was I said that sounds like a better sentence to me More like an English sentence And Ruby was asking me why And they were guessing because of the the 是特定的一项 And that's, that is the reason If we just said Psycholinguistic study is interesting would be fine. 做那个心理语言学方面的研究很有趣. Then we would use is and no problem because it's a what a generalization. 泛指这个东西. But this is the the study is 一项研究. And I say was because what? Can I tell you if it's interesting if I have not read it? And be honest? No, I won't be honest. I'll say, oh, a really interesting study, <laughs> but I haven't read it. No, we have to have read something in order to say if it's interesting or not. And if we have already finished reading it, then we say was interesting. When I was reading it, I found it interesting. Even though it's still interesting now, I'm talking about my feeling when I was reading it. So in English, we say, mm, that psycholinguistic study was interesting. Okay, Kaima. I'm not talking about psycholinguistics in general. So that was that. That was a very, uh, a very astute question. That was good. And then this is up here because um, Alex was asking about if stress is fixed in words. In a lot of words, the stress can be either one syllable or another syllable. And in this case, how do you read the word? You stress this syllable? And that's the most common, but it can also be cigarette. Cigarette. He smokes cigarettes. He smokes cigarettes. 都可以. A lot of the words that have variable stress like this are from French. They're French loan words. How about this word? Employee. Employee or? Employee. He has 14 employees. Employees. 都可以. Employees. 都不可以. But either of these is okay and either of these is okay. So there are a lot of words like this. And there's another word I can't remember now. I just seem to remember it starts with A, where there are three different syllables that can be stressed. All are fine. But that's not the majority of English words. You should get the stress right. Okay? Usually it's just one syllable that can be stressed. We're moving on now to sentence rhythm, middle of page 116. The stresses that can occur on words sometimes become modified when the words are part of sentences. So we're going to talk about intonational effects now how intonation is going to affect word stress. We already know about compound noun stress, the zi and we know about tonic stress. Tonic stress we know is going to affect word stress. It makes stresses higher, for example. They sound more prominent. 
Here we're going to talk about having too many stresses too close together in sequence. We don't like having a stressed syllable immediately followed by a stressed syllable. And we also don't like having a stressed word followed by another stressed word and another stressed word. If we have too many stressed words, 太多的实词堆起来的时候,我们就听得有点会疲乏. Too many stresses, we get tired, because the purpose of stress is to make something stand out, contrast with something else. And if everything is being made prominent, then we get fatigued. So we have a way of avoiding that in language. How do we read each of these words separately? Fifth li uh, fourth line, under sentence rhythm. Go, Mary. 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 And it's not Mary, it's Mary. Mary. There we go. Go on. Okay, this is a very famous sentence now <laughs> because we've been using this, this uh, sentence for over 10 years. It's funny. It's, it's just funny to have such a silly sentence turn up so many times. All right, so when they're said in isolation, Mary, younger, brother, wanted, 50, chocolate, peanuts. Now, I just said it as a sentence, and it sounds kind of choppy, right? In isolation, that's how we read them. But there are normally fewer sense, se uh, stresses when they occur in a sentence, such as, Mary's younger brother wanted 50 chocolate peanuts. Try it. Mary's younger brother wanted 50 chocolate peanuts. There we go. What did we do? We alternated the stresses. Every other word is stressed, and the words in between, we didn't stress them because it just was too many stresses. So we just let them put the words in. The words are too many. Too many, we just let them put the words in. Words in. in. So some people can ask for help. So we say it, Mary's younger brother wanted 50 chocolate peanuts. Thus, the first syllables of younger wanted and chocolate are pronounced without stresses, but with their full vowel qualities. Make a vowel so Just a stress not dola. The same kind of phenomenon can be demonstrated with monosyllabic words. If we have a syllable of monosyllabic content words, we're going to do the same thing. So try this sentence. Try reading it yourself. The second line of the second paragraph, go. Okay, and by the way, we don't say white. They get, they get, this one has uh, Canadian raising, white. It's not wide, it's white. Wide, white. Remember when we were talking about noodles? Remember the noodle discussion? Okay, white, wide. White, wide. Everybody? White, That's right, so it's white, not wide. Yeah, at least in probably a majority of Americans' speech. Mm. All right, so we've got all of these monosyllabic stressed words. So what do we do? The big brown bear bit 10 white mice. The big brown bear bit 10 white mice. We alternated stresses. We did something else that I keep reminding you of when you're reading. What else did we do? It's not as obvious, but we've mentioned it in class, and I keep correcting you when you don't do it. Pause, exactly, very good. Because they're monosyllabic and they have stresses, like I said, we don't like stresses close together. So we pause. If there's nothing else we can do, we have no unstressed syllables that we can use to pad the between, put padding in between the two uh, stress syllables, then we just put pauses there. So the big brown bear, big pause, that's the end of the subject, bit 10 white mice. We're going to pause. It's just too heavy, too much without the pauses. We also alternate the level of stress. So those are two different things we do to make that sentence a little more listenable. As a general rule, English does not have stresses too close together very often. Stresses on alternate words are dropped in sentences where they would otherwise come too near one another. The tendency to avoid having stresses too close together may cause the stress on a polysyllabic word to be on one syllable in one sentence and on another syllable in another. And it will be in the exercises as well. How do you say hei guan or dan huang guan? Okay, it's not clair, by the way, it's clear. Clear, yeah. Clarinet, all right? So, dan du nian is clarinet. But if we put it in front of, ah, what's the problem? 
Compound noun stress, again, it's being ignored. That's, I remember this year after year and it doesn't get fixed. So it should be clarinet solo. 它那个中音对我来说是不会变的. Clarinet solo. I'm trying to think of something with clarinet where it wouldn't be a compound noun. He had a clarinet solo. Now, this isn't the way I would say it. If you really want to emphasize solo, solo, then you would say it this way. He had a clarinet solo, not a duet. Okay? Contrast is so wait some nian. This is not a good example. But stress does move this way. So clarinet, clarinet solo. So if it were cigarette, we would probably do the same thing. You can say cigarette. He's smoking a cigarette. But this is um, a cigarette holder. Jesus a cigarette holder. Cigarette holder. Um, he plays the clarinet, clarinet solo. That's what he's trying to say. But actually, it should be clarinet solo, but never mind. The stresses on the first or the third syllable, depending on the position of the other stresses in the sentence. Similar shifts occur in phrases such as Vice President Jones versus Jones, the Vice President. Vice President Jones, President Mionama Jones. Vice President Jones versus Jones, the Vice President. Vice President Jones. Ah, so President, Nigga Jong Yin, Hao Xiang Bei, Ya Yi, La Jo Mei Yola. Vice Bi Jiao Zong Yao. Vice President Jones versus Jones, the Vice President. Numbers such as 14, 15, 16 are stressed on the first syllable when counting. So let's count from 13. Go. 13, 14, 15, Okay, that's how we count. But sometimes not in phrases such as, she's only, right. Usually if it's the predicate, then it's going to be on the second syllable, 16. She's only 16, she's only 17. If you say years old, then they both get stressed. She's 17 years old. She's 16 years old. Because teen, it really means? Teen really means what? 10. Teen is a 10. Now, 6 and teen are So, That explains why the stress can shift. Because the um, all right, let's look at this next paragraph. It says, try tapping on the indicated syllables while you read the next paragraph. Let's just read it ourselves first. Go. Tend to recur at regular intervals of time. It's often perfectly possible to tap on the stresses in time with a metronome. Okay? Does it sound pretty regular to you? Da, 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 and that's how English stress tends to work. That's why we call it stress timed. This stress, the next stress, the middle, no matter how many times you have no joint in the middle. This stress, the next stress, the length is still the same. That's the theory of stress timing. A lot of people say it's not true, it's nonsense, but we do have that tendency. No matter how many times you say it, it's just this. Let's test it. Okay, with metronome. Okay. I want you to try to read it now. Can you see it? That's pretty fast, isn't it? Let's slow it down. Okay, that's nice and slow for you. Go. Stresses in English. I think it's a little too slow. Let's make it a little faster. That's pretty good. Let's try. Stresses in English tend to recur at regular intervals of time. It's often perfectly possible to tap on the stresses in time with a metronome. The rhythm can even be said to determine the length of the pause between phrases. An extra tap can be put in the silence, as shown by the marks within the parentheses. Okay, how did that work? Looks like you had fun. 
<laughs> Did you have fun? OK. I, I hoped you would. So this paragraph shows that English stress seems to occur fairly regularly. It worked OK, didn't it? It sounded fairly natural. It did sound sing-songy, just like ding-dong bell, pussy's in the well. It sounded a little bit like la mama, but it still was pretty normal English. We have that tendency, but if you want to make it absolute, we're, we're going to have problems. So, this is not a relationship, but there really is such a tendency. I don't care what people say. A lot of people are strongly against it, but I think it's very useful uh, to think of it that way. Figure 5.3 shows another example of speech rhythm. This musical notation of the rhythm of the first 47 seconds of Barack Obama's victory speech after the Iowa primary election of 2008 shows that he came in on the beat after interruptions by a cheering crowd of supporters even after a long interruption of 16 beats. This and other instances of public speaking are so noticeably rhythmic that some artists have set them to music, dubbing rhythm tracks under the spoken word. Now we can, I can find you one. I don't have one ready, but I'll find one on YouTube if you want to. But first of all, this is new, obviously, because Barack Obama was not president during the early editions. This is added by Professor Johnson. So why don't we listen? I won't give you the, the, the um, si xuan because it's kind of distracting. So let's just listen to the audio. Were you following along? All right, can most of you read music or not? Because I've discovered a lot of Taiwanese don't actually read music. Do you, can you read music? Some of you can. Let's listen to it again. Uh, if you don't know musical notation, this is a quarter note. This is an eighth note. This is a sixteenth note. And then these are rests. This is an eighth rest. Is it a, or quarter rest? Sorry, quarter. Yeah, it's an eighth rest. This is a half rest, and this is a, a quarter rest. So this one is two beats. This is one beat. This is half a beat. All right, and the rest of them you can kind of figure out. He doesn't use any half notes here. So follow carefully in the musical notation. If you've got three. Okay, three notes together, that means uh, these, these should be eighth notes, I think. Okay, so three eighth notes together, it's da da da, da da da, Let's listen just one more time. All right, does it sound kind of musical already? They said, and then he goes on. He's really an outstanding speaker. He's one of the really, really good speakers, I think, in American politics historically speaking as well. And there have been some really good speakers. When you, when you uh, become a high official, you learn how to speak, even if you didn't before. I don't know if you remember with Chen Shui Bian, but he used to be very but then he became much smoother after he became president. He learned. This January night, this January night, okay? And that's quite parallel at this Defining moment in history. Go. You have done what the cynic said we couldn't do. OK. He uses rhythm to great advantage in his speaking. Um, there's another thing that they do with uh, people who sometimes are interviewed for a news story. And they'll say something kind of funny. And other people will set it to music. I'll see if I can find it on YouTube here. So lots of people are watching this now. This is popular. So here we go. They use something called auto-tune. Have you heard of auto-tune? Do you know what it is? Can you explain? Uh -huh. it's, a, it's a kind of software. If you are recording as a singer and sometimes you hit the wrong pitch, they can use this software to make you sing on pitch. But, and all of you have heard it on the radio. Do you sometimes hear people that suddenly start sounding like computers? Okay, maybe I should show you what auto tune is first. 
It's also called the Cher effect. You know Sonny and Cher? She's a pop singer from my generation. Cher. Maybe when you hear her, you should, you'll recognize her. She was popular when I was your age. Okay. Cher. But don't say sure. It's <laughs> Cher. You heard it? You've heard that in pop music, right? That's done by auto-tune. Do you like that effect? Amy, not so sure. The rest of you? It depends. It depends? Is that Amy? That's OK. And for some, you think it's OK. OK, I personally despise it. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I really hate it. And in pop music now, they rely on it too much. And a lot of people get lazy about their singing because they know that the software can adjust their pitch when they sing wrong, if they're singing out of tune. So that's auto-tune. I, I really, really dislike it. But anyway, it's, it's used way too much in pop songs now. You've heard it a lot. Now, um, auto-tune is used to turn people's uh, lines, sentences that people say in interviews that strike, strike some people as funny, and they turn them into silly songs. And that's what happened with this one that's so popular that it popped up right away. She's saying, I got bronchitis. Bronchitis is And she says, Ain't nobody got time for that. So ain't nobody got time for that. It was a, it was a nice interview. You can see it yourself on, on uh, YouTube. And they just thought that her interview, uh, it's in black English. And they made it into this song. Now there's a guy, a fat guy dancing in a leotard. It's <laughs> All right, so anyway, that's, that's what they're talking about here, I think. This is what he's talking about. So we're talking about speech and rhythm. There's a definite rhythm. Um, we're on page 118. And he says, of course, not all sentences are as regular as those discussed in the preceding paragraphs. Sentences tend to recur, uh, sorry, not sentences, stresses tend to recur at regular intervals. It would be quite untrue to say that there is always an equal interval between stresses in English. So we say that English is stressed time as opposed to what for French? The two that we usually contrast are stress timed for a language like English, German is also stress timed, as opposed to French, which is syllable timed, right? And they're saying that each syllable is about approximately the same length. But that's not true of French either. If you want to measure, it's not quite true. But we do have that impression there is that tendency. And that's why these terms and ideas are still useful. Um, it is just that English has a number of processes that act together to maintain the rhythm. Uh, we have already mentioned two of these. First, we saw that some words that might have been stressed are nevertheless often unstressed, thus preventing too many stresses from coming together. So when we alternate stress in a word with a lot of content words, in a sentence with a lot of content words, then uh, that's one way we regulate the rhythm. We get rid of some of the stresses when we feel there are too many. Um, to give another example, both wanted and pretty can be stressed in she wanted a pretty parrot, but may not be stressed in my aunt wanted 10 pretty parrots. My aunt wanted 10 pretty parrots. As soon as we get too many stresses, then we start de-stressing some of them because it gets to be um, too fatiguing. Second, we saw that some words have variable stress. Compare the unknown man with the man is very good, unknown. So if it's the predicate at the end of the sentence, that's one thing. That's called the shu yu, actually, in Chinese. Shu yu or shu bu. Then it will often have the stress at the end. But if it is modifying a noun, if it occurs before a noun, then the stress will be more to the beginning. This is pretty common. We can also consider some of the facts mentioned in the previous chapter as part of the same tendency to reduce the variation in the interval between stresses. We saw that the vowel in speed is longer than the first vowel in speedy, and this in turn is longer than the first vowel in speedily. Memorize this, you might need it in the test. Okay, so speed, 
in isolation is pretty long. Speedy, that E has gotten shorter because we have to fit two syllables into about the same time, right? Everybody follow what I'm saying? Speed, we've got just one syllable so it can be very long and lazy. But speedy has two syllables so each syllable has to be faster. So the E is going to get shorter. And if we say speedily, it's going to get even, even shorter. And don't say shorter, everybody. Look at my mouth. Shorter. shorter. Yeah, not shorter. Uh, shorter, shorter. Watch that. Mm, okay, so that's speedily. This can be interpreted as a tendency to minimize the variation in the length of words containing only a single stress. That means, 一个字,它只有一个中音的情况之下,不管它是一个音节,两个音节,三个音节, 我们是尽量让它站的时间差不多长. Speed, speedy, speedily. Okay, 它, 它, 它占用的时间都差不多, even though one has one, one has two, one has three syllables. Is that okay? Everybody's got that? And this can be interpreted as a tendency to minimize, we did that, um, so that adjacent stresses remain much the same distance apart. Okay. Um, did we did we recite Ding Dong Bell in class? Okay, I did it for Dai Ying Wen, but not for this class. It's a mother goose rhyme called Ding Dong Bell. And that's the first line. How many how many uh, how many syllables in the first line? We have three. Ding dong bell. And how many beats do we have? Ding dong bell. How many beats? Two beats and three syllables, right? We're going to give each line two beats, okay? And I want you to count the syllables in the last line. And listen as the syllables grow in length. The number of syllables increases with each successive line. So listen. Ding dong bell. Pussy's in the well. Who put her in? Little Tommy Lynn. Who pulled her out? Little Tommy Stout. What a naughty boy was that to try to drown poor pussycat who never did him any harm but killed the mice in his father's barn. <laughs> All right, so ding dong bell. How many syllables? Three. three syllables, two beats, three syllables. The last line also has two beats, but how many syllables? But killed the mice in his father's barn. But killed the mice in his father's barn. Count carefully. But killed the mice in his father's barn. Some of you miss the ers and fathers because they're all one syllable words except fathers. So you don't know, fathers, the ers. But killed the mice in his father's barn. How many? Nine syllables. Ding dong bell, three syllables. Is as long as but killed the mice in his father's barn. Okay? That illustrates it, I think, as clearly as I can illustrate it. How, uh, Everyone's got that? All right, that's the point here. We're on to intonation now. We still have a little time. We have hope for uh, making headway here. So I'm sorry we're not having people read today because I just wanted to get through this. Listen to the pitch of the voice while someone says a sentence. You will find that it's changing continuously. We're so used to it that we don't even notice it. But the pitch is constantly changing. We're at the bottom of 118 now. The difference between speaking and singing is that in singing, you hold a given note for a notable, noticeable length of time and then jump to the pitch of the next note. So listen to the pitch. Listen to the pitch. It's gone by so fast, and we're still on san or liang. Are you sing liang? Liang zhi. Wo di zi xue de shou zi OK. Da zi kou le. Yeah, I was, I was 16 years old at the time. All right, so liang zhi lao hu. And then listen to the pitch. Liang, that's all we got. So we're still holding that first pitch, and we've already said a whole phrase. The point is that pitch changes really fast in speech. In singing, we'll hold it for a longer period of time till we get to the next note. That's what he's saying here. But when one is speaking, there are no steady state pitch pitches. If we, if we lengthen a syllable, it sounds weird, and there's a reason for it. Uh, for example, if you say, Daddy, 
then you have something in mind, right? You want to borrow some money or whatever it is. <laughs> okay, you have a certain purpose. Normally, we don't hold pitches that long in speech. Mm. Throughout every syllable in a normal conversational utterance, the pitch is going up or down. Try talking with steady state pitches and notice how odd it sounds. <laughs> Go, try it. Okay, we have a room full of robots <laughs> or monks chanting at a funeral, right? Uh huh. You can't really do that with Chinese, can you? Because you're going to lose all your tones. But you could try to do it because there are Chinese robots too, right? Just pick a Chinese sentence, Chuang Tian Mi Guang. Try to say that with steady state pitch. What happens? Is it still recognizable? It is because everybody knows that poem, right? But try it again. Is it still Chinese? Not quite? You recognize it because you know the poem, but it doesn't sound like correct Chinese anymore, does it? So how do Chinese robots sound? Do they lose their tones completely? Like Xiao Ding Dang or something like that. You must have Chinese robots. Do they lose their tones? You guys aren't sure. I can see you're asking each other. Anybody know for sure? All right, if you're not sure, please put it down and I'll ask you next time. I want you to tell me, do Chinese robots lose their tones? I'm not sure either, because when my kids turned on Xiao Ding Dang, I went to another room. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> um, the intonation of a sentence is its pattern of pitch changes. The part of a sentence over which a particular pattern extends is called an bold words. Watch out for the test, yes, intonational phrase. So that's one thing we can call hua. Because an intonational phrase includes a tonic stress. So what I was calling hua or an utterance, here we're calling an intonational phrase if it includes one tonic stress. A short sentence forming a single intonational phrase is shown in sentence one below. We know the new mayor. We know the new mayor. That's a single intonational phrase. In this and all the subsequent illustrations of different intonations in this chapter, two curves are shown. The top one represents the changes in pitch for a British speaker and the one below for an American speaker. Are they very similar? Just looking at this page, are they similar? Largely, zhi. Do you think they're similar or not similar? They're pretty similar, aren't they? And that's another thing that I have sort of looked into since knowing my British friend for so long, is we differ on vowels, we differ on some consonants, but we don't differ much in intonation. British and American English, they have some special intonations we don't have. We have some special ones they don't have. But for the most part, we share most intonations. Most of them are pretty much the same in British and American. There is not that much difference. It sounds different. It's mostly their vowels and consonants. Okay? Our intonations are largely very, very similar, except for a few. We each, we each have our own personalities. Um, they are not completely smooth curves because they show the actual pitches of the utterances on the CD. The irregularities reflect how the vocal folds vibrated when producing these sentences. So, you're in Buguetza, but they just took something called a pitch track. And you have this in pot if you want to play with it. It's called pitch track. It'll just mark your fundamental frequency. And then draw a line showing your, your intonation. So you can do that with pot if you want. You can do it with wasp even. Wasp is much simpler. It'll just show it for you. But in order to get your GP, your fundamental frequency, what is the In order to get a fundamental frequency, what do you have to have first? What's the prerequisite? Yes, voicing, right. So you have to have voicing, for example, e, u, n, r, z, in order to get a pitch track. If you don't have voicing, the software is clever, it will try to guess. But it'll usually 
it'll be drying like um, so. We are in the shop. It'll go crazy at shh because that's right, because of all those high frequencies and the fricatives. They try to design the software so it, it knows that and it doesn't get all mixed up because of it, but it's very difficult. Even really clever pro programmers have trouble with that. So if you're using pitch track, it will not be accurate with voiceless sounds. I can tell you that right now. I don't know if I'll put it in the test, but you should know that. So when you're using a pitch track, if it's voiceless, we have no way of finding out what the fundamental frequency is. And that's what determines the intonation is the fundamental frequency, how fast your vocal folds are vibrating. Um, in most cases, there is no pitch scale indicated, as it is usually the relative pitches within a phrase that are important. So, this is the The time scale varies from utterance to utterance, allowing the graphs to fit the dimensions of the page. The sentence spoken is shown below. Uh, the pitch curve in ordinary spelling, but with IPA stress marks added. Here we're not using IPA because we're more interested in stress, so we're not going to worry about the vowels and consonants so much. But there's also a single syllable that stands out because it carries the major pitch strain uh, change. This syllable carries the tonic accent, tonic stress, same thing. I don't distinguish. They're the same to me. Tonic stress, tonic accent. And we will mark those with an asterisk, and you already know how to do that, right? From our quiz that we had with compound noun stress, right? We used an asterisk to show tonic accent or tonic stress. There's a pitch peak on the stressed syllable no, indicating that this syllable also had an accent, although the tonic accent on mayor is more prominent. Now it looks like mayor is lower, but we know the new mayor. The reason for that is the more we talk, the closer we get to the end of a sentence or the end of a paragraph, what happens to our voice? It slowly gets lower and lower. The pitch gets lower and lower. At the beginning of a new topic, a new paragraph, we start out high and energetic. And the more we talk, the more bored your listener gets, right? And the less energy we have, and when we're finishing up, our voice is quite low. There's downstepping. That's called declination. Declination. We'll see it in the book, so you don't have to worry too much now. Um, the tonic accent usually occurs on the last stressed syllable in a tone group in neutral intonation. I wouldn't say usually, it's always. It's always the last stressed syllable in, a, uh, in an intonational phrase. That gets the tonic stress. Okay? It, it always is that way. And if it's not, then you've started a new phrase. But it may occur earlier if some word requires emphasis. In that case, I say, oh, man, and they should those deep pink down. They're unstressed. So I would still say that it's the final stressed syllable in an intonational phrase. Um, for example, in this, in this sentence, um, we know the new mayor. It's still the final stressed syllable. We know the new mayor implies what? We don't know the old one. We only know the new one. So we're contrasting. That's contrastive stress. Sometimes there are two or more intonational phrases within an utterance. When this happens, the first one ends in a small rise, which is called a continuation rise. We're going through this fast, first because it's getting close to the end of the semester and we have to hurry. But second, don't you know a lot of this stuff already? Yeah. A lot of it you've heard me nag you about. I'm always nagging you when you're reading, right? I've told you most of this stuff already, both in my nagging and in the shi de le pian, de de, in the ji pian. Those three articles, the ones that I told you to reread and take notes on, this is pretty much the same stuff. And this is partly where I learned some of it anyway. Bu fen was tong zi xue dao de, and I learned other parts of it elsewhere, and some from personal experience. But the point is, this stuff should already be familiar material to you in this class. Um, the continuation rise indicates that there is more to come and the speaker has not yet completed the utterance. The break between two intonational phrases may be marked, as in sentence three, by a single vertical stroke. And I told you that before. Just pause, 不是很长, 
就是一条直线。If it's the end of a sentence, then we have a longer pause. Then it's a double vertical stroke. 两条直线 That's 比较长的 pause.、Um, the British speaker in three signals that there's more to come by having a full、uh, fall on in. When we came in, we had dinner. All right. So he pauses at in. The American speaker does this by prolonging the word in, which starts at the peak of the pitch contour. So when we came in, we had dinner. So that's just two different ways of of managing, of truly processing the same information. When we came in, we had dinner. When we came in, we had dinner. They're doing the same thing in slightly different ways. In three, the two intonational phrases can be associated with the two syntactic clauses within the sentence. All right, now we're talking about 句法 and、um, I'm not really into syntax, and I definitely don't do Chomsky, but their approach to it is definitely reflected in intonation. So all of those trees that you draw in syntax, remember? Yeah, they reflect what we do in intonation. They are real. They're not just something made up by people who have nothing better to do. They really exist. We do organize speech in different levels, and we reflect that in our intonation. The different stresses, the pauses, those will all be reflected in those trees you draw in syntax class. Okay? So, I mean, work on that. Take it seriously, and then try to connect it to phonetics, and you'll find a lot of interesting stuff. So here it's the syntax that tells us we have to break. When we came in, we had dinner. All right. So pause. We finish this new clause, and he's going to say that it's the information that matters.、Um, so it's difficult to tell not only where the intonation breaks occur, but also where the tonic stress will fall. As one linguist put it, intonation is predictable if you are a mind reader. Now I don't agree with this, and when I correct you. I bet most native speakers would agree with me. The way I tell you to read, if I tell you to pause here, continuation rise here, most native speakers haven't analyzed it and they can't give it names, but they will tell you to do it in the same way. I don't know if any of you had class last year with Sarah Brooks. Did anybody have Sarah Brooks for a teacher? You, just one person. All right. And did she teach you similar things and how to read when to pause? Not so much. But I've seen her students perform, and they perform beautifully. She doesn't do phonetics; that's not her specialty. But her students sound beautiful when they perform. She teaches them through imitation. Yeah, this, this, a, that's the teacher who took my place when I was away last year. She teaches them through intonation, and she tutors them. She mentors them. She teaches them through intonation, and she tutors them. She mentors them. She teaches them through intonation, and she tutors them. She mentors them. She teaches them through intonation, and she tutors them. The Xi Wen Bo Bo Ren Yuan, those presenters, they will mostly start the sentence in the same way. It's the same thing.、Um, you have to know what is in the speaker's mind before you can say exactly what will be accented. But not really. If you're reading something in context, you're reading something in context. Uh huh. It's something interesting. All right. If you have the context and you know what's going on, then you really can predict most of the stresses. 有不同的诠释是真的 but most people will agree on probably the best interpretation. When speaking slowly in a formal style, a speaker may choose to break a sentence up. Obamian oratory will produce a large number of intonational phrases, and that was true of Chen Shui-bian as well. He stopped constantly. 两个字，三个字，停一下。两个字，三个字，停一下。Do you still remember him? <laughs> okay, all right. Look him up on YouTube or something and listen to him talk. And he he chopped his speech up into very very short phrases. That's what he did, and that's what Obama does. Speakers usually do that when they have a big audience because they want to be understood easily. And if you speak too fast, people won't catch everything. Uh, but in rapid conversational style, there is likely to be only one per sentence. Now that's a too big generalization. But when we are conversing, we speak in shorter bursts. 句子比较短 so we have fewer pauses like that. Not like、uh, the politicians do it. Okay, and I guess we better stop there. We've got another section coming up, and let's see how much we have left. We are not going to be tested on Toby. 
And Toby starts on page 127 and goes through 129, uh, 130. Right. We're going to just look at it briefly. We're going to look at Toby briefly. The reason is because I'm not really happy with the presentation of Toby in this textbook. I, I just will not happy. I think you should learn Toby, but maybe learn it from a different source. So we'll just go over the ideas behind Toby. It's a way of marking intonation with just a few symbols, with letters and stars and things. And that will be about it. So this chapter, if, we're, if we really push, um, we may finish it next time. I know it's really rushed, but like I said, I think you know most of this material already. The stuff that's new, pay special attention to it, because that will certainly be in the test. And I would like you to start on the exercises, page 131. And we'll do the performance exercises as well. These are not so bad. Start early. And you're already perfectly able of doing all the exercises. If there's anything unclear, just check the text. So start doing the exercises. They will probably be due in another week. Today is the 5th. 5 plus 7 is 12. So probably on the 12th, December 12th, we'll need to hand in the exercises. Are there any questions? Are we OK? So we're going to finish this up fast, and then we're going to go back to chapter 4. That's it. Um, don't forget to go back to the web pages that you didn't, if you didn't do them carefully before, on the schwa, on schwa elision, on contractions. I want you to know the difference between formal and informal contractions. You need to be able to tell me. What's the difference between a formal and an informal contraction? And also, we use them differently. For example, one of them we don't use in writing. Also, the three Shida articles. Um, also, the tutorials on voicing and plosives, if you need to review those. That's it. We will see you next Monday.